This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joy Chan. Mysticism, a study in nature and development of spiritual consciousness by Evelyn Underhill. First half of Part 2, Chapter 4. The Illumination of the Self. In illumination, we come to that state of consciousness which is popularly supposed to be peculiar to the mystic, a form of mental life, a kind of perception radically different from that of normal men. His preceding adventures and experiences cannot be allowed this quality. His awakening to consciousness of the absolute, though often marked by a splendor and intensity which seem to distinguish it from other psychic upheavals of that kind, does but reproduce upon higher levels those characteristic processes of conversion and falling in love which give depth and actuality to the religious and passional life. The purification to which he then sets himself, though this possesses as a rule certain features peculiar to mystical development, is again closely related to the disciplines and mortifications of ascetic, but not necessarily mystical, piety. It is the most exalted form with which we are acquainted of that catharsis, that pruning and training of the human plant, which is the essence of all education, and a necessary stage in every kind of transcendence. Here the mystic does but adopt in a more drastic form the principles which all who would live with intense life, all seekers after freedom, all true lovers, must accept, though he may justly claim with Ophelia that these wear their root with a difference. But in the great swing back into sunshine, which is the reward of that painful descent into the cell of self-knowledge, he parts company with these other pilgrims. Those who still go with him a little way, certain prophets, poets, artists, dreamers, do so in virtue of that mystical genius, that instinct for transcendental reality, of which all seers and creators have some trace. The initiates of beauty or of wisdom, as the great mystic is the initiate of love, they share in some degree the experiences of the way of illumination. But the mystic has now a veritable foothold in that transcendental world into which they penetrate now and again, enjoys a certain fellowship, not yet union, with the great life of the all, and thence draws strength and peace. Really and actually, as one whose novitiate is finished, he has entered the inner choir, where the soul joineth hands and danceth with Sophia, the divine wisdom and, keeping time with the great rhythms of the spiritual universe, feels that he has found his place. This change of consciousness, however abrupt and amazing it may seem to the self which experiences it, seems to the psychologist a normal phase in that organic process of development which was initiated by the awakening of the transcendental sense. Responding to the intimations received in that awakening, ordering itself in their interests, concentrating its scattered energies on this one thing, the self emerges from long and varied acts of purification to find that it is able to apprehend another order of reality. It has achieved consciousness of a world that was always there, and wherein its substantial being, that ground which is of God, has always stood. Such a consciousness is transcendental feeling in excelsis, a deep intuitional knowledge of the secret plan. We are like a choir who stand round the conductor, says Plotinus, but do not always sing in tune, because their attention is diverted by looking at external things. So we always move round the one. If we did not, we should dissolve and cease to exist. But we do not always look towards the one. Hence, instead of that free and conscious cooperation in the great life of the all, which alone can make personal life worth living, we move like slaves or marionettes, and oblivious of the whole to which our little steps contribute, fail to observe the measure whereto the world keeps time. Our minds being distracted from the Corypheus in the midst of the energetic word who sets the rhythm, we do not behold him. We are absorbed in the illusions of sense. The eye which looks on eternity is idle. But when we do behold him, says Plotinus again, we attain the end of our existence and our rest. Then we no longer sing out of tune, but form a truly divine chorus about him, in the which chorus dance the soul beholds the fountain of life, the fountain of intellect, the principle of being, the cause of good, the root of soul. Such a beholding, such a lifting of consciousness from self-centered to a God-centered world 
is of the essence of illumination. It will be observed that in these passages the claim of the mystic is not yet to supreme communion, the spiritual marriage of the Christian mystic, or that flight of the alone to the alone, which is the Platonian image for the utmost bliss of the emancipated soul. He has now got through preliminaries, detached himself from his chief entanglements, reoriented his instinctive life. The result is a new and solid certitude about God and his own soul's relation to God, an enlightenment in which he is adjusted to new standards of conduct and thought. In the traditional language of ascetism, he is proficient but not yet perfect. He achieves a real vision and knowledge, a conscious harmony with the divine world of becoming, not yet self-lost in the principle of life, but rather a willing and harmonious revolution about him that in dancing he may know what is done. This character distinguishes almost every first-hand description of illumination, and it is this which marks it off from mystic union in all its forms. All pleasurable and exalted states of mystic consciousness in which the sense of I-hood persists, in which there is a loving and joyous relation between the absolute as object and the self as subject, fall under the head of illumination, which is really an enormous development of the intuitional life at high levels. All veritable and first-hand apprehensions of the divine obtained by the use of symbols, as in the religious life, all the degrees of prayer lying between meditation and the prayer of union, many phases of poetic inspiration and glimpses of truth, are activities of the illuminated mind. To see God in nature, to attain a radiant consciousness of the otherness of natural things, is the simplest and commonest form of illumination. Most people under the spell of emotion or of beauty have known flashes of rudimentary vision of this kind. Where such a consciousness is recurrent, as it is in many poets, there results that partial yet often overpowering apprehension of the infinite life imminent in all things, which some modern writers have dignified by the name of nature mysticism. Where it is raised to its highest denomination, till the veil is obliterated by the light behind, and faith has vanished into sight, as sometimes happened to Blake, we reach the point at which the mystic swallows up the poet. Dear sir, says the great genius in one of his most characteristic letters, written immediately after an onset of the illuminated vision, which he had lost for many years. Excuse my enthusiasm, or rather madness, for I am really drunk with intellectual vision whenever I take a pencil or graver into my hand. Many a great painter, philosopher or poet, perhaps every inspired musician, has known this indescribable inebriation of reality in those moments of transcendence in which his masterpieces were conceived. This is the saving madness of which Plato speaks in the Phaedrus, the ecstasy of the God-intoxicated man, the lover, the prophet, and the poet drunk with life. When the Christian mystic eager for his birthright says, Sangrius Christi, inebria me, he is asking for just such a gift of supernal vitality, a draught of that wine of absolute life which runs in the arteries of the world. Those to whom that cup is given attain to an intenser degree of vitality, hence to a more acute degree of perception, a more vivid consciousness than that which is enjoyed by other men. For though, as Rusburic warns us, this is not God, yet it is for many selves the light in which we see him. Blake conceived that it was his vocation to bring this mystical illumination, this heightened vision of reality, within the range of ordinary men, to cleanse the doors of perception of the race. They thought him a madman for his pains. I rest not upon my great task to open the eternal worlds, to open the immortal eyes of man inwards into the worlds of thought, into eternity ever expanding in the bosom of God, the human imagination. O Saviour, pour upon me thy spirit of meekness and love, annihilate the selfhood in me, be thou all my life. The mysteries of the antique world appear to have been attempts, often by way of a merely magical initiation, to open the immortal eyes of man inwards, exalt his powers of perception until they could receive the messages of a higher degree of reality. In spite of much eager theorizing, it is impossible to tell how far they succeeded in this task. To those who had a natural genius for the infinite, 
symbols and rituals which were doubtless charged with ecstatic suggestions, and often dramatized the actual course of the mystic way, may well have brought some enhancement of consciousness, though hardly that complete rearrangement of character which is an essential of the mystic's entrance on the true illuminated state. Hence Plato only claims that he whose initiation is recent can see immortal beauty under mortal veils. O blessed he and all wise, who hath drunk the living fountain, whose life no folly staineth, and whose soul is near to God, whose sins are lifted poor-wise, as he worships on the mountain. Thus sang the initiates of Dionysus, that mystery cult in which the Greeks seemed to have expressed all they knew of the possible movement of consciousness through rites of purification to the ecstasy of the illuminated life. The mere crude rapture of illumination has seldom been more vividly expressed. With its half-oriental fervours, its self-regarding glory and personal purification achieved, and the spiritual superiority conferred by adeptship, may be compared to the deeper and lovelier experience of the Catholic poet and saint, who represents the spirit of Western mysticism at its best. His sins, too, have been lifted pole-wise, as a cloud melts in the sunshine of divine love. But here the centre of interest is not the little self which has been exalted, but the greater self which deigns thus to exalt. O oh, burn that burns to heal! O oh, more than pleasant wound! O oh, soft hand, O oh, touch most delicate, that dost new life reveal, that dost in grace abound, and slaying dost from death to life translate. Here the joy is as passionate, the consciousness of an exalted life as intense, but it is dominated by the distinctive Christian concepts of humility, surrender, and intimate love. We have seen that all real artists, as well as all pure mystics, are sharers to some degree in the illuminated life. They have drunk with Blake from that cup of intellectual vision which is the chalice of the spirit of life. Know something of its divine inebriation whenever beauty inspires them to create. Some have only sipped it. Some, like John of Palmer, have drunk deep, accepting in that act the mystic heritage with all its obligations. But to all who have seen beauty face to face, the grail has been administered, and through that sacramental communion they are made participants in the mystery of the world. In one of the most beautiful passages of the Fioretti, it is told how Brother Jacques of La Massa, unto whom God opened the door of his secrets, saw in a vision this chalice of the spirit of life, delivered by Christ into the hands of St. Francis, that he might give his brothers to drink thereof. Then came St. Francis to give the chalice of life to his brothers, and he gave it first to Brother John of Parma, who, taking it, drank it all in haste devoutly, and straightway he became all shining like the sun. And after him St. Francis gave it to all the other brothers in order, and there were but few among them that took it with due reverence and devotion, and drank it all. Those that took it devoutly and drank it all became straightway shining like the sun, but those that spilled it all and took it not devoutly became black and dark and mishapen and horrible to see. But those that drank part and spilled part became partly shining and partly dark, and more so or less according to the measure of their drinking or spilling thereof. But the aforesaid brother John was resplendent above all the rest, the which had more completely drunk the chalice of life, whereby he had the more deeply gazed into the abyss of the infinite light divine. No image, perhaps, could suggest so accurately as this divine picture the conditions of perfect illumination. The drinking deeply, devoutly, and in haste, that is, without prudent and self-regarding hesitation, of the heavenly wine of life, that wine of which Roll says that it fulfills the soul with a great gladness through a sweet contemplation. John of Palmer the hero of those spiritual Franciscans in whose interest this exquisite allegory was composed, stands for all the mystics who, having completely drunk, have attained the power of gazing into the abyss of the infinite light divine. In those imperfect brothers who dared not drink the cup of sacrifice to the dregs, but took part and spilled part, so that they became partly shining and partly dark, according to the measure of their drinking or spilling thereof, we may see an image of the artist, musician, prophet, poet, dreamer, more or less illuminated according to the measure of courage and self-abandonment 
in which he has drunk the cup of ecstasy. But always in comparison with the radiance of the pure contemplative, partly shining and partly dark. Hinder me not, says the soul to the senses in Mechthild of Magdeburg's vision. I would drink for a space of the unmingled wine. In the artist, the senses have somewhat hindered the perfect inebriation of the soul. We have seen that a vast tract of experience, or the experience which results from contact between a purged and heightened consciousness and the world of becoming in which it is immersed, and much, too, of that which results from contact set up between such a consciousness and the absolute itself, is included in that stage of growth which the mystics call the illuminative way. This is the largest and most densely populated province of the mystic kingdom. Such different visionaries as Suso and Blake, Boehm and Angelo Foligno, Mechthild of Magdeburg, Fox, Roll, St. Teresa, and countless others have left us the record of their sojourn therein. Amongst those who cannot be called pure mystics, we can detect in the works of Plato and Heraclitus, Wordsworth, Tennyson, and Walt Whitman, indications that they too were acquainted, beyond most poets and seers, with the phenomena of the illuminated life. In studying it, then, we shall be confronted by a mass of apparently irreconcilable material, the results of the relation set up between every degree of lucidity, every kind of character, and the suprasensible world. To say that God is infinite is to say that he may be apprehended and described in an infinity of ways. That circle whose centre is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere may be approached from every angle with a certainty of being found. Mystical history, particularly that which deals with the illuminative way, is a demonstration of this fact. Here in the establishment of the first mystic life, of conscious correspondence with reality, the self which has oscillated between two forms of consciousness has alternately opposed and embraced its growing intuitions of the absolute, comes for a time to rest. To a large extent, the discordant elements of character have been purged away. Temporally, at least, the mind has unified itself upon high levels and attained, as it believes, a genuine consciousness of the divine and veritable world. The depth and richness of its own nature will determine how intense that consciousness shall be. Whatever its scope, however, this new apprehension of reality generally appears to the illuminated self as final and complete, as the true lover is always convinced that he has found in his bride the one rose of the world, so the mystic in the first glow of his initiation is sure that his quest is now fulfilled, ignorant as yet of that consummation of love which overpasses the proceedings of the inward eye and ear. He exclaims with entire assurance, Beati oculi qui exterioribus closi, interioribus autum sunt intenti, and, absorbed in this new blissful act of vision, forgets that it belongs to those who are still in via. He has yet to pass through that night of the senses in which he learns to distinguish the substance of reality from the accidents under which it is perceived, to discover that the heavenly food here given cannot satisfy his hunger for the absolute. His true goal lies far beyond this joyful basking in the sunbeams of the uncreated light. Only the greatest souls learn this lesson and tread the whole of that king's highway which leads man back to his source. For the many that come to Bethlehem, there be few that will go on to Calvary. The rest stay here, in this earthly paradise, these flowery fields, where the liberated self wanders at will, describing to us as well as it can, now this corner, now that, the country of the soul. It is in these descriptions of the joy of illumination, in the outpourings of love and rapture belonging to this state, that we find the most lyrical passages of mystical literature. Here poet, mystic, and musician are on common ground, for it is only by the oblique methods of the artist, by the use of aesthetic suggestions and musical rhythm, that the wonder of that vision can be expressed. When essential goodness, truth, and beauty, light, life, and love, are apprehended by the heart, whether the heart be that of poet, painter, lover, or saint, that apprehension can only be communicated in a living, that is to say, an artistic form. The natural mind is conscious only of succession. The special differentia of the mystic is the power of apprehending simultaneity. 
In the peculiarities of the illuminated consciousness, we recognize the effort of the mind to bridge the gap between simultaneity and succession, the characters of creator and creation. Here the successive is called upon to carry the values of the eternal. Here, then, genius and sanctity kiss one another, and each in that sublime encounter looks for an instant through the other's eyes. Hence it is natural and inevitable that the mystic should here call into play all the resources of artistic expression, the lovely imagery of Julian and Mechthild of Magdeburg, Suso's poetic visions, St. Augustine's fire and light, the heavenly harmonies of St. Francis and Richard Roll. Symbols, too, play a major part, not only in the description, but also in the machinery of illumination. The intuitions of many mystics presenting themselves directly to the surface mind in a symbolic form. We must, therefore, be prepared for a great variety and fluidity of expression, a constant and not always conscious recourse to symbol and image, in those who try to communicate the secret of this state of consciousness. We must examine and even classify, so far as possible, a wide variety of experience, some which is recognized by friends and foes alike as purely mystical, some in which the operation of poetic imagination is clearly discernible, some which involve psychic phenomena and other abnormal activities of the mind, refusing to be frightened away from investigation by the strange and apparently irreconcilable character of our material. There are three main types of experience which appear again and again in the history of mysticism, nearly always in connection with illumination rather than any other phase of mystical development. I think that they may fairly be regarded as its main characteristics, though the discussion of them cannot cover all the ground. In few forms of spiritual life is the spontaneity of the individual so clearly seen as here, and in few is the ever-deadly process of classification attended with so many risks. These three characteristics are 1. A joyous apprehension of the absolute, that which many ascetic writers call the practice of the presence of God. This, however, is not to be confused with that unique consciousness of union with the divine, which is peculiar to a later stage of mystical development. The self, though purified, still realizes itself as a separate entity over against God. It is not immersed in its origin, but contemplates it. This is the betrothal rather than the marriage of the soul. 2. This clarity of vision may also be enjoyed in regard to the phenomenal world. The actual physical perceptions seem to be strangely heightened, so that the self perceives an added significance and reality in all natural things, is often convinced that it knows at last the secret of the world. In Blake's words, the doors of perception are cleansed, so that everything appears to man as it is, infinite. In these two forms of perception we see the growing consciousness of the mystic stretching in two directions, until it includes in its span both the world of being and the world of becoming. That dual apprehension of reality is transcendent yet imminent which we found to be one of the distinguishing marks of the mystic type. 3. Along with this twofold extension of consciousness, the energy of the intuitional or transcendental self may be enormously increased. The psychic upheavals of the purgative way have tended to make it central for life, to eliminate from the character all those elements which checked its activity. Now it seizes upon the ordinary channels of expression, and may show itself in such forms as a. auditions, b. dialogues between the surface consciousness and another intelligence which purports to be divine, c. visions, and sometimes d. in automatic writings. In many selves, this automatic activity of those growing but still largely subconscious powers which constitute the new man increases steadily during the whole of the mystic life. Illumination, then, tends to appear mainly under one or all of these three forms. Often all are present, though as a rule one is dominant. The balance of characteristics will be conditioned in each case by the self's psychic makeup, its temperamental leaning towards pure contemplation, lucid vision or automatic expression, emanation or imminence, the metaphysical, artistic or intimate aspects of truth. The possible combinations between these various factors are as innumerable as the possible creations of life itself. In the wonderful rhapsodies of St. Augustine, in St. Bernard's converse with the Word, in Angelo Foligno's apprehensions of deity, 
in Richard Roll's state of song, when sweetest heavenly melody he took with him dwelling in mind, or in Brother Lawrence's practice of the presence of God, we may see varied expressions of the first type of illuminated consciousness. Jacob Bohm is rightly looked upon as a classic example of the second, which is also found in one of its most attractive forms in St. Francis of Assisi. Suso and St. Teresa, perhaps, may stand for the third, since in them the visionary and auditory phenomena were peculiarly well marked. A further study of each characteristic in order will help us to disentangle the many threads which go to the psychical makeup of these great and complex mystic types. The rest of this chapter will, then, be given to the analysis of the two chief forms of illuminated consciousness, the self's perception of reality in the eternal and temporal worlds. The important subject of voices and visions demands a division to itself. 1. The consciousness of the absolute, or sense of the presence of God. This consciousness, in its various forms and degrees, is perhaps the most constant characteristic of illumination, and makes it, for the mystic soul, a pleasure state of the intensest kind. I do not mean by this that the subject passes months or years in a continuous ecstasy of communion with the divine. Intermittent periods of spiritual fatigue or aridity, renewals of the temperamental conflicts experienced in purgation, the oncoming gloom of the dark night, all these may be, and often are, experienced at intervals during the illuminated life, as flashes of insight, indistinguishable from illumination, constantly break the monotony of the purgative way. But a deep certitude of the personal life omnipresent in the universe has been achieved, and this can never be forgotten, even though it be withdrawn. The spirit stretching towards God declares that it has touched him, and its normal condition henceforth is joyous consciousness of his presence, with many privy touchings of sweet spiritual sights and feeling, measured to us as our simpleness may bear it. Where he prefers less definite or more pantheistic language, the mystic's perceptions may take the form of harmony with the infinite, the same divine music transposed to a lower key. This sense of God is not a metaphor. Innumerable declarations prove it to be a consciousness as sharp as that which other men have, or think they have, of colour, heat, or light. It is a well-known, though usually transitory, experience in the religious life, like the homey instinct of birds, a fact which can neither be denied nor explained. How that presence is felt, it may better be known by experience than by any writing, says Hilton, for it is the life and the love, the might and the light, the joy and the rest of a chosen soul. And therefore he that hath soothfastly once felt it, he may not forbear it without pain. He may not undesire it. It is so good in itself and so comfortable. He cometh privily sometimes when thou art least aware of him, but thou shalt well know him or he go. For wonderfully he stirreth, and mightily he turneth thy heart into beholding of his goodness, and doth thine heart melt electably as wax against the fire into softness of his love. Modern psychologists have struggled hard to discredit this sense of the presence, sometimes attributing it to the psychic mechanism of projection, sometimes to wish fulfilments of a more unpleasant origin. The mystics, however, who discriminate so much more delicately than their critics between true and false transcendental experience, never feel any doubt about its validity. Even when their experience seems inconsistent with their theology, they refuse to be disturbed. Thus St. Teresa writes of her own experience with her usual simplicity and directness. In the beginning it happened to me that I was ignorant of one thing. I did not know that God was in all things. And when he seemed to me to be so near, I thought it impossible. Not to believe that he was present was not in my power, for it seemed to me, as it were, evident that I felt there his very presence. Some unlearned men used to say to me that he was present only by his grace. I could not believe that, because, as I am saying, he seemed to me to be present himself. So I was distressed. A most learned man of the order of the glorious patriarch St. Dominic delivered me from this doubt, for he told me that he was present, and how he communed with us. This was a great comfort to me. Again, an interior peace and the little strength which either pleasures or displeasures have to remove this presence 
during the time it lasts, of the three persons, and that without power to doubt of it, continue in such a manner that I clearly seem to experience what St. John says, that he will dwell in the soul, and this not only by grace, but that he will also make her perceive this presence. St. Teresa's strong, immanental bent comes out well in this passage. Such a sense of the divine presence may go side by side with the daily life and normal mental activities of its possessor, who is not necessarily an ecstatic or an abstracted visionary, remote from the work of the world. It is true that the transcendental consciousness has now become, once for all, his centre of interests. Its perceptions and admonitions dominate and light up his daily life. The object of education, in the platonic sense, has been achieved. His soul has wheeled round from the perishing world to the contemplation of the real world and the brightest part thereof. But where vocation and circumstances require it, the duties of a busy outward life continue to be fulfilled with steadiness and success, and this without detriment to the soul's contemplation of the real. In many temperaments of the unstable or artistic type, however, this intuitional consciousness of the absolute becomes ungovernable. It constantly breaks through obtaining forcible possession of the mental field and expressing itself in the psychic phenomena of ecstasy and rapture. In others, less mobile, it wells up into an impassioned apprehension, a flame of love in which the self seems to meet God in the ground of the soul. This is pure contemplation, that state of deep horizon in which the subject seems to be seeing, feeling and thinking all at once. By this spontaneous exercise of all his powers under the dominion of love, the mystic attains that vision of the heart which, more interior perhaps than the visions of dream or ecstasy, stretches to the full those very faculties which it seems to be holding in suspense, as a top sleeps when it is spinning fast. Ego domio et cor meum vigilat. This act of contemplation, this glad surrender to an overwhelming consciousness of the presence of God, leaves no sharp image on the mind, only a knowledge that we have been lifted up to a veritable gazing upon that which I hath not seen. St. Bernard gives in one of his sermons a simple, ingenious, and obviously personal account of such privy touchings, such convincing but elusive contacts of the soul with the Absolute. Now bear with my foolishness for a little, he says, for I wish to tell you, as I have promised, how such events have taken place in me. It is indeed a matter of no importance, but I put myself forward only that I may be of service to you, and if you derive any benefit, I am consoled for my egotism. If not, I shall but have displayed my foolishness. I confess, then, though I say it in my foolishness, that the word has visited me, and even very often. But, though he has frequently entered into my soul, I have never at any time been sensible of the precise moment of his coming. I have felt that he was present. I remember that he has been with me. I have sometimes been able even to have a presentiment that he would come, but never to feel his coming nor his departure. From whence he came to enter my soul, or whither he went on quitting it, by what means he has made entrance or departure, I confess that I know not even to this day. According to that which is said, Neshusun de veniatot quo vadat. Nor is this strange, because it is to him that the psalmist has said in another place, Vestigia tua non cognoscentur. It is not by the eyes that he enters, for he is without form or colour that they can discern, nor by the ears, for his coming is without sound, nor by the nostrils, for it is not with the air, but with the mind that he is blended. By what avenue, then, has he entered? Or perhaps the fact may be that he has not entered at all, nor indeed come at all from outside for not one of these things belongs to outside. Yet it has not come from within me, for it is good, and I know that in me dwelleth no good thing. I have ascended higher than myself, and lo, I have found the word above me still. My curiosity has led me to descend below myself also, and yet I have found him still at a lower depth. If I have looked without myself, I have found that he is beyond that which is outside of me, and if within, he was at an inner depth still. And thus have I learned the truth of the words I have read. In ipso enem vivimus et movemur et sumus. 
Such a lifting up, such a condition of consciousness as that which St. Bernard is here trying to describe, seems to snatch the spirit for a moment into a state which it is hard to distinguish from that of true union. This is what the contemplatives call passive or infused contemplation, or sometimes the horizon of union, a brief foretaste of the unitive state, often enjoyed for short periods in the illuminative way, which reinforces their conviction that they have now truly attained the absolute. It is but a foretaste, however, of that attainment, the precocious effort of a soul still in that stage of enlightening which the theologia Germanica declares to be belonging to such as are growing. This distinction between the temporary experience of union and the achievement of the unitive life is well brought out in a fragment of dialogue between soul and self in hue of St. Victor's mystical tract, the Ara Animae. The soul says, Tell me, what can be this thing of delight that merely by its memory touches and moves me with such sweetness and violence that I am drawn out of myself and carried away I know not how? I am suddenly renewed, I am changed, I am plunged into an ineffable peace. My mind is full of gladness, all my past wretchedness and pain is forgot. My soul exalts, my intellect is illuminated, my heart is afire. My desires have become kindly and gentle. I know not where I am because my love has embraced me. Also, because my love has embraced me, I seem to have become possessed of something, and I know not what it is, but I try to keep it that I may never lose it. My soul strives in gladness that she may not be separated from that which she desires to hold fast for ever, as if she had found in it the goal of all her desires. She exalts in a sovereign and ineffable manner, seeking naught, desiring naught, but to rest in this. Is this, then, my beloved? Tell me that I may know him, and that if he come again I may entreat him to leave me not, but to stay with me for ever. Man says, It is indeed thy beloved who visits thee, but he comes in an invisible shape. He comes disguised, he comes incomprehensibly. He comes to touch thee, not to be seen of thee, to arouse thee, not to be comprehended of thee. He comes not to give himself wholly, but to be tasted by thee, not to fulfill thy desire, but to lead upwards thy affection. He gives a foretaste of his delights, brings not the plenitude of a perfect satisfaction, and the earnest of thy betrothal consists chiefly in this, that he who shall afterwards give himself to be seen and possessed by thee perpetually, now permits himself to be sometimes tasted, that thou mayest learn how sweet he is. This shall console thee for his absence, and the savour of this gift shall keep thee from all despair. The real distinction between the illuminative and the unitive life is that in illumination the individuality of the subject, however profound his spiritual consciousness, however close his apparent communion with the infinite, remains separate and intact. His heightened apprehension of reality lights up rather than obliterates the rest of his life and may even increase his power of dealing adequately with the accidents of normal existence. Thus Brother Lawrence found that his acute sense of reality, his apprehension of the presence of God, and the resulting detachment and consciousness of liberty in regard to mundane themes, upheld and assisted him in the most unlikely tasks, as, for instance, when he was sent into Burgundy to buy wine for his convent, which was a very unwelcome task to him, because he had no turn for business, and because he was lame, and could not go about the boat, but by rolling himself over the casks. That, however, he gave himself no uneasiness about it, nor about the purchase of the wine. That he said to God, it was his business he was about, and that he afterwards found it very well performed. So likewise in his business in the kitchen, to which he had naturally a great aversion. The mind, concentrated upon a higher object of interest, is undistracted by its own anxieties, likes or dislikes, and hence performs the more efficiently the work that is given it to do. Where it does not do so, then the normal make-up or imperfect discipline of the subject, rather than its mystical proclivities, must be blamed. St. Catherine of Genoa found in this divine companionship the power which made her hospital a success. St. Teresa was an administrative genius and an admirable housewife 
and declared that she found her god very easily amongst the pots and pans. Appearances notwithstanding, Mary would probably have been a better cook than Martha, had circumstances required of her this form of activity. In persons of feeble or diffuse intelligence, however, and above all in victims of a self-regarding spirituality, this deep absorption in the sense of divine reality may easily degenerate into monoideism. Then the shady side of illumination, a selfish preoccupation with transcendental joys, the spiritual gluttony condemned by St. John of the Cross, comes out. I made many mistakes, says Madame Guyon pathetically, through allowing myself to be too much taken up by my interior joys. I used to sit in a corner and work, but I could hardly do anything, because the strength of this attraction made me let the work fall out of my hands. I spent hours in this way without being able to open my eyes or to know what was happening to me, so simply, so peacefully, so gently that sometimes I said to myself, Can heaven itself be more peaceful than I? Here we see Madame Guyon basking like a pious tabby cat in the beams of the uncreated light, and already leaning to the extravagances of quietism, with its dangerous double character of passivity and beatitude. The heroic aspect of the mystic vocation is in abeyance. Those mystical impressions which her peculiar psychic makeup permitted her to receive have been treated as a source of personal and placid satisfactions, not as a wellspring, whence new vitality might be drawn for great and self-giving activities. It has been claimed by the early biographers of St. Catherine of Genoa that she passed in the crisis of her conversion directly through the purgative to the unitive life, and never exhibited the characteristics of the illuminative way. This has been effectually disproved by Baron von Hugel, though he too is inclined in her case to reject the usual sequence of the mystic states. Yet the description of Catherine's condition after her four great penitential years were ended, as given in chapter 6 of Vita e Dottrina, is an almost perfect picture of healthy illumination of the inward or immanental type, and makes an effective foil to the passage which I have quoted from Madame Guyon's life. No doubt there were hours in which St. Catherine's experience, as it were, ran ahead, and she felt herself not merely lit up by the indwelling light, but temporarily merged in it. These moments are responsible for such passages as the beautiful fragment in Chapter 5, which does, when taken alone, seem to describe the true unitive state. Sometimes, she said, I do not see or feel myself to have either soul, body, heart, will or taste, or any other thing except pure love. Her normal condition of consciousness, however, was clearly not yet that which Julian of Norwich calls being one with bliss, but rather an intense and continuous communion with an objective reality, which was clearly realised as distinct from herself. After the aforesaid four years, says the next chapter of the Vita, there was given unto her purified mind, free and filled with God, insomuch that no other thing could enter into it. Thus, when she heard sermons or mass, so much was she absorbed in her interior feelings that she neither heard nor saw that which was said or done without. But within, in the sweet divine light, she saw and heard other things, being wholly absorbed by that interior light, and it was not in her power to act otherwise. St. Catherine, then, is still a spectator of the Absolute, does not feel herself to be one with it. And it is a marvellous thing that with so great an interior recollection the Lord never permitted her to go beyond control. But when she was needed, she always came to herself so that she was able to reply to that which was asked of her. And the Lord guided her that none could complain of her. And she had her mind so filled by love divine that conversation became hard to her. And by this continuous taste and sense of God Several times she was so greatly transported that she was forced to hide herself that she might not be seen. It is clear, however, that Catherine herself was aware of the transitory and imperfect nature of this intensely joyous state. Her growing transcendental self, unsatisfied with the sunshine of the illuminative way, the enjoyment of the riches of God, already aspired to union with the divine. With hers, with all truly heroic souls, it was love for love, not love for joy. She cried to God because he gave her so many consolations. Non voglio quello 
che è stradate, ma so voglio te, o dolce amore. Non voglio quello che è stradate. When the growing soul has reached this level of desire, the illuminative way is nearly at an end. It has seen the goal, that country which is no mere vision but a home, and is set upon the forward march. So Rabia the Muslim saint, O oh my God, my concern and my desire in this world is that I should remember thee above all the things of this world, and in the next that out of all who are in that world I should meet with thee alone. So Gertrude Moore, no knowledge which we can here have of thee can satisfy my soul-seeking and longing without ceasing after thee. Alas, my Lord God, what is all thou canst give to a loving soul which sigheth and panteth after thee alone, and esteemeth all things as dung, that she may gain thee? What is all I say whilst thou givest not thyself, who art that one thing which is only necessary, and which alone can satisfy our souls? Was it any comfort to St. Mary Magdalene, when she sought thee, to find two angels which presented themselves instead of thee? Verily I cannot think it was any joy unto her, for that soul that hath set her whole love and desire on thee can never find any true satisfaction, but only in thee. What is the nature of this mysterious mystic illumination? Apart from the certitude it impacts, what is the form which it most usually assumes in the consciousness of the self? The illuminative seem to assure us that its apparently symbolic name is really descriptive, that they do experience a kind of radiance, a flooding of the personality with new light. A new sun rises above the horizon and transfigures their twilight world. Over and over again they return to light imagery in this connection. Frequently, as in their first conversion, they report an actual and overpowering consciousness of radiant light, ineffable in its splendour, as an accompaniment of their inward adjustment. Soprone lengua amore, bonda senza figura, lume fuora di misura resplende nel mio core, sang Giacopone da Todi. Light rare, untellable, said Whitman. The flowing light of the Godhead, said Nectir of Magdeburg, trying to describe what it was that made the difference between her universe and that of normal men. Lux vixens dicit, said St. Hildegard of her revelations, which she described as appearing in a special light, more brilliant than the brightness round the sun. It is an infused brightness, says St. Teresa, a light which knows no night, but rather, as it is always light, nothing ever disturbs it. Desipito parve giorno a giorno a sere adiunto, exclaims Dante, initiated into the atmosphere of heaven. Lume e lassu is his constant declaration. Siocchio dico e in simplice lume, his last word in the effort to describe the soul's apprehension of the being of God. It really seems as though the mystic's attainment of new levels of consciousness did bring with it the power of perceiving a splendour always there, but beyond the narrow range of our poor sight, to which it is only a luminous darkness at the best. In eternal nature or the kingdom of heaven, said Law, materiality stands in life and light. The cumulative testimony on this point is such as would be held to prove in any other department of knowledge that there is indeed an actual light, lighting the very light and awaiting the recognition of men. End of first half of part two, chapter four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joy Chan. Mysticism, a study in nature and development of spiritual consciousness by Evelyn Underhill. Second half of Part 2, Chapter 4. Consider the accent of realism with which St. Augustine speaks of his own experience of platonic contemplation, a passage in which we seem to see a born psychologist desperately struggling by means of negations to describe an intensely positive state. I enter it into the secret closet of my soul, led by thee, 
and this I could do because thou wast my helper. I entered and beheld with the mysterious eye of my soul the light that never changes, above the eye of my soul, above my intelligence. It was not the common light which all flesh can see, nor was it greater yet of the same kind, as if the light of day were to grow brighter and brighter and flood all space. It was not like this, but different, altogether different from all such things. Nor was it above my intelligence in the same way as oil is above water or heaven above earth, but it was higher because it made me, and I was lower because made by it. He who knoweth the truth knoweth that light, and he who knoweth it knoweth eternity. Love knoweth it. Here, as in the cases of St. Teresa, St. Catherine of Genoa, and Jacopone da Todi, we have a characteristically immanental description of the illuminated state. The self, by the process which mystics call introversion, the deliberate turning inwards of its attention, its cognitive powers, discerns reality within the heart. The rippling tide of love which flows secretly from God into the soul and draws it mightily back into its source. But the opposite or transcendental tendency is not less frequent. The cosmic vision of infinity, exterior to the subject, the expansive, outgoing movement towards a divine light. Che visible face lo creatore a quella creatura, che solo in lui vedera alla sua parte. Wholly other than anything the earth-born creature can conceive, the strange, formless absorption in the divine dark to which the soul is destined to ascend. All these modes of perception are equally characteristic of the illuminative way. As in conversion, so here reality may be apprehended in either transcendent or imminent, positive or negative terms. It is both near and far, closer to us than our most inward part, and higher than our highest. And for some selves, that which is far is easiest to find. To a certain type of mind, the veritable practice of the presence of God is not the intimate and adorable companionship of the personal comrade or the inward light, but the awestruck contemplation of the Absolute, the naked Godhead, source and origin of all that is. It is an ascent to the supernal plane of perception, where the simple, absolute and unchangeable mysteries of heavenly truth lie hidden in the dazzling obscurity of the secret silence, outshining all brilliance with the intensity of their darkness, and surcharging our blinded intellects with the utterly impalpable and invisible fairness of glories which exceed all beauty. With such an experience of eternity, such a vision of the triune, all-including absolute, which binds the universe with love, Dante ends his divine comedy, and the mystic joy with which its memory fills him is his guarantee that he has really seen the inviolate rose, the flaming heart of things. O oh, abbondante grazia, onde o prosunsi, ficca lo viso per la luce eterna, tanto che la veduta vi consunsi. Nel suo profonde vide che s'interna, legato con amore in volume, ciò che per l'universo si squaderna. Sustanzie et accidente, e lo costume, quasi conflati insieme per tal modo, che ciò che io dico è in semplice lume. La forma universal di questo nodo, credo che io vidi per se più di lago, dicendo questo, mi sento che io godo. O oh, quanto è cotto il dire, e come fio co al mio concetto, e questo è quel che io vidi, e tanto che non basta e dice poco. O oh, luce eterna, che sola in te sidi, sole t'intendi, e date intelletta, ed intendente te, e mi ed aridi. O oh, grace abounding, wherein I presumed to fix my gaze on the eternal light, so long that I consumed my sight thereon. In its depths I saw ingathered the scattered leaves of the universe, bound into one book by love. Substance and accident and their relations, as if fused together in such a manner that what I tell of is a simple light. And I believe that I saw the universal form of this complexity. Because, as I say this, I feel that I rejoice more deeply. Oh, but how scant the speech and how faint to my concept, and that to what I saw is such, that it suffices not to call it little. O little eternal, who only in thyself abidest, only thyself dost comprehend, and of thyself comprehended, and thyself comprehending, dost love and smile. 
In Dante, the transcendent and impersonal aspect of illumination is seen in its most exalted form. It seems at first sight almost impossible to find room within the same system for this expansive vision of the undifferentiated light and such intimate and personal apprehensions of deity as Lady Julian's conversations with her courteous and dear worthy lord or St. Catherine's companionship with love divine. Yet all these are really reports of the same psychological state. Describe the attainment by selves of different types of the same stage in the soul's progressive apprehension of reality. In a wonderful passage, unique in the literature of mysticism, Angelo Foligno has reported the lucid vision in which he perceived this truth, the twofold revelation of an absolute at once humble and omnipotent, personal and transcendent, the unimaginable synthesis of unspeakable power and deep humility. The eyes of my soul were opened, and I beheld the plenitude of God, wherein I did comprehend the whole world, both here and beyond the sea and the abyss and ocean and all things. In all these things I beheld naught save the divine power, in a manner assuredly indescribable, so that through excess of marvelling the soul cried with a loud voice, saying, This whole world is full of God. Wherefore I now comprehended how small a thing is the whole world, that is to say, both here and beyond the seas, the abyss, the ocean and all things, and that the power of God exceeds and fills all. Then he said unto me, I have shown thee something of my power, and I understood that after this I should better understand the rest. He then said, Behold now my humility. Then was I given an insight into the deep humility of God towards man, and comprehending that unspeakable power, and beholding that deep humility, my soul marvelled greatly, and did esteem itself to be nothing at all. It must never be forgotten that all apparently one-sided descriptions of illumination, more all experience of it, are governed by temperament. That light whose smile kindles the universe is ever the same, but the self through whom it passes, and by whom we must receive its report, has already submitted to the moulding influences of environment and heredity, church and state. The very language of which that self avails itself in its struggle for expression links it with half a hundred philosophies and creeds. The response which it makes to divine love will be the same in type as the response which its nature would make to earthly love, but raised to the nth degree. We, receiving the revelation, receive with it all those elements which the subject has contributed in spite of itself. Hence the soul's apprehension of divine reality may take almost any form, from the metaphysical ecstasies which we find in Dionysius, to a less degree in St. Augustine, to the simple, almost common-sense statements of Brother Lawrence, the emotional ardours of St. Gertrude, or the lovely intimacies of Julian or Mechthild. Sometimes, so rich and varied does the nature of the great mystic tend to be, the exalted and impersonal language of the Dionysian theology goes, with no sense of incongruity, side by side with homely parallels drawn from the most sweet and common incidents of daily life. Suso, in whom illumination and purgation existed side by side for sixteen years, alternately obtaining possession of the mental field, and whose oscillations between the harshest mortification and the most ecstatic pleasure states were exceptionally violent and swift, is a characteristic instance of such an attitude of mind. His illumination was largely of the intimate and immanental type, but, as we might expect in a pupil of Eckhart, it was not without touches of mystical transcendence, which break out with sudden splendour side by side with those tender and charming passages in which the servitor of the eternal wisdom tries to tell his love. Thus he describes in one of the earlier chapters of his life how, whilst he was thinking, according to his custom, of the most lovable wisdom, he questioned himself and interrogated his heart, which sought persistently for love, saying, O oh my heart, whence comes this love and grace? Whence comes this gentleness and beauty, this joy and sweetness of the heart? Does not all this flow forth from the Godhead as from its origin? Come, let my heart, my senses, and my soul immerse themselves in the deep abyss whence come these adorable things. What shall keep me back? Today I will embrace you, even as my burning heart desires to do. And at this moment there was within his heart, as it were, an emanation of all good, all that is beautiful, 
all that is lovable and desirable was there spiritually present, and this in a manner which cannot be expressed. Whence came the habit that every time he heard God's praises sung or said, he recollected himself in the depths of his heart and soul, and thought on that beloved object, whence comes all love? It is impossible to tell how often, with eyes filled with tears and open heart, he has embraced his sweet friend, and pressed him to a heart overflowing with love. He was like a baby which a mother holds upright on her knees, supporting it with her hands beneath its arms. The baby, by the movement of its little head and all its little body, tries to get closer and closer to its dear mother, and shows by its little laughing gestures the gladness in its heart. Thus did the heart of the servitor ever seek the sweet neighbourhood of the divine wisdom, and thus he was, as it were, altogether filled with delight. 2. THE ILLUMINATED VISION OF THE WORLD Closely connected with the sense of the presence of God, or power of perceiving the Absolute, is the complementary mark of the illuminated consciousness, the vision of a new heaven and a new earth, or an added significance and reality in the phenomenal world. Such words as those of Julian, God is all thing that is good as to my sight, and the goodness that all thing hath, it is he, seem to supply the link between the two. Here again we must distinguish carefully between vaguely poetic language, the light that never was, every common bush afire with God, and descriptions which can be referred to a concrete and definite psychological experience. This experience at its best balances and completes the experience of the presence of God at its best. That is to say, its note is sacramental, not ascetic. It entails the expansion rather than the concentration of consciousness. The discovery of the perfect one self-revealed in the many, not the forsaking of the many in order to find the one. Its characteristic expression is, The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. Not turn thy thoughts into thy own soul where he is hid. It takes, as a rule, the form of an enhanced mental lucidity, an abnormal sharpening of the senses, whereby an ineffable radiance, a beauty and a reality never before suspected, are perceived by a sort of clairvoyance shining in the meanest things. From the moment in which the soul has received the impression of deity in infused horizon, says Malaval, she sees him everywhere, by one of love's secrets which is only known of those who have experienced it. The simple vision of pure love, which is marvellously penetrating, does not stop at the outer husk of creation. It penetrates to the divinity which is hidden within. Thus Browning makes David declare, I but open my eyes, and perfection, no more, no less, in the kind I imagine full fronts me, and God is seen God, in the star, in the stone, in the flesh, in the soul and the clod. Blake's, to see a world in a grain of sand, Tennyson's flower in the crannied wall, Vaughan's each bush and oak doth know I am, and the like, are exact though over-quoted reports of things seen in this state of consciousness, this simple vision of pure love, the value of which is summed up in Eckhart's profound saying, the meanest thing that one knows in God, for instance if one could understand a flower as it has its being in God, this would be a higher thing than the whole world. Mystical poets of the type of Wordsworth and Walt Whitman seem to possess in a certain degree this form of illumination. It is this which Buck, the American psychologist, analysed under the name of cosmic consciousness. It is seen at its full development in the mystical experiences of Boehm, Fox and Blake. We will take first the experience of Jacob Boehm, a mystic who owed little or nothing to the influence of tradition, and who furnishes one of the best recorded all-round examples of mystical illumination exhibiting, along with an acute consciousness of divine companionship, all those phenomena of visual lucidity, automatism, and enhanced intellectual powers which properly belong to it, but are seldom developed simultaneously in the same individual. In Bohm's life, as described in an introduction to the English translation of his collected works, there were three distinct onsets of illumination, all of the pantheistic and external type. In the first, which seems to have happened whilst he was very young, we are told that he was surrounded by a divine light for seven days 
and stood in the highest contemplation and kingdom of joy. This we may perhaps identify with mystical awakening of the kind experienced by Suso. About the year 1600 occurred the second illumination, initiated by a trance-like state of consciousness, the result of gazing at a polished disc. To this I have already referred. This experience brought with it that peculiar and lucid vision of the inner reality of the phenomenal world in which, as he says, he looked into the deepest foundations of things. He believed that it was only a fancy, and in order to banish it from his mind, he went out upon the green. But here he remarked that he gazed into the very heart of things, the very herbs and grass, and that actual nature harmonized with what he had inwardly seen. Of this same experience and the clairvoyance which accompanied it, another biographer says, Going abroad in the fields to a green before Nez Gate at Gorlitz, he sat there down, and, viewing the herbs and grass of the field in his inward light, he saw into their essences, use and properties, which were discovered to him by their lineaments, figures and signatures. In the unfolding of these mysteries before his understanding, he had a great measure of joy, yet returned home and took care of his family, and lived in great peace and silence, scarce intimating to any these wonderful things that had befallen him. So far as we can tell from his own scattered statements, from this time onwards Bohm must have enjoyed a frequent and growing consciousness of the transcendental world, though there is evidence that he, like all other mystics, knew seasons of darkness, many a shrewd repulse, and times of struggle with that powerful contrarian the lower consciousness. In 1610, perhaps as the result of such intermittent struggles, the vivid illumination of ten years before was repeated in an enhanced form, and it was in consequence of this, and in order that there might be some record of the mysteries upon which he had gazed, that he wrote his first and most difficult book, The Aurora, or Morning Redness. The passage in which the inspired shoemaker has tried to tell us what his vision of reality was like, to communicate something of the grave and enthusiastic travail of his being, the unspeakable knowledge of things which he attained, is one of those which arouse in all who have even the rudiments of mystical perception the sorrow and excitement of exiles who suddenly hear the accents of home. Like absolute music, it addresses itself to the whole being, not merely to the intellect. Those who will listen and be receptive will find themselves repaid by a strange sense of extended life, an exhilarating consciousness of truth. Here, if ever, is a man who is struggling to speak as he saw, and it is plain that he saw much, as much perhaps as Dante, though he lacked the poetic genius which was needed to give his vision an intelligible form. The very strangeness of the phrasing, the unexpected harmonies and dissonances which worry polite and well-regulated minds, are earnests of the spirit of life crying out for expression from within. Boehm, like Blake, seems drunk with intellectual vision, a God-intoxicated man. In this my earnest and Christian seeking and desire, he says, wherein I suffered many a shrewd repulse, but at last resolved rather to put myself in hazard than give over and leave off. The gate was open to me, that in one quarter of an hour I saw and knew more than if I had been many years together at a university, at which I exceedingly admired and thereupon turned my praise to God for it. For I saw and knew the being of all beings, the abyss and the abyss, and the eternal generation of the Holy Trinity, the descent and the original of the world, and of all creatures through the divine wisdom, knew and saw in myself all the three worlds, namely, the divine, angelical, and paradisical, and the dark world, the original of the nature to the fire, and then thirdly, the external and visible world, being a procreation of external birth from both the internal and spiritual worlds. And I saw and knew the whole working essence in the evil and the good, and the original and existence of each of them, and likewise how the fruitful bearing womb of eternity brought forth. Yet however I must begin to labour in these great mysteries, as a child that goes to school, I saw it as in a great deep in the eternal, for I had a thorough view of the universe as in a chaos, wherein all things are couched and wrapped up, but it was impossible for me to explain the same. 
yet it opened itself to me, from time to time, as in a young plant, though the same was with me for the space of twelve years, and as it was as it were breeding, and I found a powerful instigation within me, before I could bring it forth into external form of writing, and whatever I could apprehend with the external principle of my mind, that I wrote down. Close to this lucid vision of the reality of things, this sudden glimpse of the phenomenal in the light of the intelligible world, is George Fox's experience at the age of twenty-four as recorded in his journal. Here, as in Boehm's case, it is clear that a previous and regrettable acquaintance with the doctrine of signatures has to some extent determined the language and symbols under which he describes his intuitive vision of actuality as it exists in the divine mind. Now was I come up in spirit through the flaming sword into the paradise of God. All things were new, and all the creation gave another smell unto me than before, beyond what words can utter. The creation was opened to me, and it was showed me how all things had their names given them, according to their nature and virtue. And I was at a stand in my mind whether I should practice physic for the good of mankind, seeing the nature and virtue of the creatures were so open to me by the Lord. Great things did the Lord lead me unto, and wonderful depths were opened unto me, beyond what can by words be declared. But as people come into subjection to the Spirit of God, and grow up in the image and power of the Almighty, they may receive the word of wisdom that opens all things, and come to know the hidden unity in the eternal being. To know the hidden unity in the eternal being, know it with an invulnerable certainty, in the all-embracing act of consciousness with which we are aware of the personality of those we truly love, is to live at its fullest the illuminated life, enjoying all creatures in God and God in all creatures. Lucidity of this sort seems to be an enormously enhanced form of the poetic consciousness of otherness in natural things, the sense of a unity and separateness, a mighty and actual life beyond that which I can see a glorious reality shining through the phenomenal veil, frequent in those temperaments which are at one with life. The self then becomes conscious of the living reality of that world of becoming, the vast arena of the divine creativity in which the little individual life is immersed. Alike in howling gale and singing cricket, it hears the crying aloud of that word which is through all things everlastingly. It participates actively and open-eyed in the mighty journey of the sun towards the Father's heart, and seeing with purged sight all things and creatures as they are in that transcendent order, detects in them too that striving of creation to return to its centre which is the secret of the universe. A harmony is thus set up between the mystic and life in all its forms. Undistracted by appearance, he sees, feels, and knows it in one piercing act of loving comprehension. And the bodily sight stinted, says Julian, but the spiritual sight dwelled in mine understanding, and I abode with reverent dread, joying in that I saw. The heart outstrips the clumsy senses, and sees, perhaps for an instant, perhaps for long periods of bliss, an undistorted and more veritable world. All things are perceived in the light of charity, and hence under the aspect of beauty. For beauty is simply reality seen with the eyes of love, as in the case of another and more beautific vision, essere in caritate e qui necesse. For such a reverent and joyous sight, the meanest accidents of life are radiant. The London streets are paths of loveliness, the very omnibuses look like coloured archangels, their laps filled full of little trustful souls. Often when we blame our artists for painting ugly things, they are but striving to show us a beauty to which we are blind. They have gone on ahead of us, and attained that state of fourfold vision to which Blake laid claim, in which the visionary sees the whole visible universe transfigured, because he has put off the rotten rags of sense and memory, and put on imagination uncorrupt. In this state of lucidity, symbol and reality, nature and imagination are seen to be one, and in it are produced all the more sublime works of art, since these owe their greatness to the impact of reality upon the artistic mind. I know, says Blake again, that this world is a world of imagination and vision. I see everything I paint in this world, but everybody does not see alike. 
To the eye of a miser, a guinea is far more beautiful than the sun, and a bag worn with the use of money has more beautiful proportions than a vine filled with grapes. The tree which moves some to tears of joy is in the eyes of others only a green thing which stands in the way. Some see nature all ridicule and deformity, and by these I shall not regulate my proportions. And some scarce see nature at all. But to the eyes of the man of imagination, nature is imagination itself. As a man is, so he sees. As the eye is formed, such are its powers. You certainly mistake when you say that the visions of fancy are not to be found in this world. To me this world is all one continued vision of fancy or imagination, and I feel flattered when I am told so. If the mystic way be considered as an organic process of transcendence, this illuminated apprehension of things, this cleansing of the doors of perception, is surely what we might expect to occur as man moves towards higher centres of consciousness. It marks the self's growth towards free and conscious participation in the absolute life its progressive appropriation of that life by means of the contact which exists in the deeps of man's being, the ground or spark of the soul between the subject and the transcendental world. The surface intelligence, purified from the domination of the senses, is invaded more and more by the transcendent personality. The new man, who is by nature a denizen of the independent spiritual world, and whose destiny in mystical language is a return to his origin, Hence an inflow of new vitality, a deeper and wider apprehension of the mysterious world in which man finds himself, and an exaltation of his intuitive powers. In such moments of clear sight and enhanced perception as that which Blake and Boehm describe, the mystic and the artist do really see, suspicie eternitatis, the fourfold river of life, that world of becoming in which, as Eregina says, every visible and invisible creature is a theophany or appearance of God, as all perhaps might see it, if prejudice, selfhood, or other illusion did not distort our sight. From this loving vision there comes very often that beautiful sympathy with that abnormal power over all living natural things, which crops up again and again in the lives of the mystical saints to amaze the sluggish minds of common men, barred by the torrent of use and want, from all free and deep communion alike with their natural and supernatural origin. Yet it is surely not very amazing that St. Francis of Assisi, feeling and knowing, not merely believing, that every living creature was veritably and actually a theophany or appearance of God, should have been acutely conscious that he shared with these brothers and sisters of his the great and lovely life of the all. Nor, this being so, can we justly regard him as eccentric because he acted in accordance with his convictions, preached to his little sisters the birds, availed himself of the kindly offices of the falcon, enjoyed the friendship of the pheasant, soothed the captured turtle doves, his simple minded sisters innocent and chaste, or persuaded his brother wolf to a better life. The true mystic, so often taunted with a denial of the world, does but deny the narrow and artificial world of self and finds in exchange the secrets of that mighty universe which he shares with nature and with God. Strange contacts, unknown to those who only lead the life of sense, are set up between his being and the being of all other things. In that remaking of his consciousness which follows upon the mystical awakening, the deep and primal life which he shares with all creation has been roused from its sleep. Hence the barrier between human and non-human life, which makes man a stranger on earth, as well as in heaven, is done away. Life now whispers to his life. All things are his intimates, and respond to his fraternal sympathy. Thus it seems quite a simple and natural thing to the little poor man of Assisi, whose friend the pheasant preferred his cell to the haunts more natural to its state, that he should be ambassador from the terrified folk of Gubbio to his formidable brother the wolf. The result of the interview, reduced to ordinary language, could be paralleled in the experience of many persons who have possessed this strange and incommunicable power over animal life. O oh, wondrous thing! Whereas St. Francis had made the sign of the cross, right so the terrible wolf shut his jaws and stayed his running, and when he was bid, came gently as a lamb and laid him down at the feet of St. Francis. 
and St. Francis stretching forth his hand to take pledge of his troth, the wolf lifted up his right paw before him, and laid it gently on the hand of St. Francis, giving thereby such sign of good faith as he was able. Then quoth St. Francis, Brother wolf, I bid thee in the name of Jesu Christ, come now with me, nothing doubting, and let us go establish this peace in God's name. And the wolf obedient set forth with him, in fashion as a gentle lamb, whereat the townsfolk made mighty marvel beholding, and thereafter this same wolf lived two years in Agobio, and went like a tame beast in and out the houses from door to door, without doing hurt to any, or any doing hurt to him, and was courteously nourished by the people. And as he passed thus wise through the country and the houses, never did any dog bark behind him. At length, after a two years' space, Brother Wolf died of old age, whereat the townsfolk sorely grieved, sith so marking him pass so gently through the city, they minded them the better of the virtue and the sanctity of St. Francis. In another mystic, less familiar than St. Francis to English readers, Rose of Nima, the Peruvian saint, this deep sympathy with natural things assumed a particularly lovely form. To St. Rose, the whole world was a holy fairyland, in which it seemed to her that every living thing turned its face towards eternity and joined in her adoration of God. It is said in her biography that when at sunrise she passed through the garden to go to her retreat, she called upon nature to praise with her the author of all things. Then the trees were seen to bow as she passed by, and clasp their hands together, making a harmonious sound. The flowers swayed upon their stalks and opened their blossoms that they might scent the air, thus according to their manner praising God. At the same time the birds began to sing, and came and perched upon the hands and shoulders of Rose. The insects greeted her with a joyous murmur, and all which had life and movement joined in the concert of praise she addressed to the Lord. Again, and here we catch an echo of the pure Franciscan spirit, the gaiety of the troubadours of God. During her last Lent, each evening at sunset a little bird with an enchanting voice came and perched upon a tree beside her window, and waited till she gave the sign to him to sing. Rose, as soon as she saw her little feathered chorister, made herself ready to sing the praises of God, and challenged the bird to this musical duel in a song which she had composed for this purpose. Begin, dear little bird, she said, begin thy lovely song. Let thy little throat, so full of sweet melodies, pour them forth, that together we may praise the Lord. Thou dost praise thy Creator, I, my sweet Saviour. Thus we together bless the Deity. Open thy little beak, begin, and I will follow thee, and our voices shall blend in a song of holy joy. At once the little bird began to sing, running through his scale to the highest note. Then he ceased, that the saint might sing in her turn. Thus did they celebrate the greatness of God, turn by turn, for a whole hour, and with such perfect order, that when the bird sang, Rose said nothing, and when she sang in her turn, the bird was silent, and listened to her with a marvellous attention. At last, towards the sixth hour, the saint dismissed him, saying, Go, my little chorister, go, fly far away, but blessed be my God who never leaves me. The mystic whose illumination takes such forms as these, who feels with this intensity and closeness the bond of love which binds in one book the scattered leaves of all the universe, dwells in a world unknown to other men. He pierces the veil of imperfection, and beholds creation with the Creator's eye. The pattern is shown him in the mount. The whole consciousness, says Reseja, is flooded with light to unknown depths, under the gaze of love from which nothing escapes. In this stage, intensity of vision and sureness of judgment are equal, and the things which the seer brings back with him when he returns to common life are not merely partial impressions or the separate knowledge of science or poetry. They are rather truths which embrace the world, life and conduct. In a word, the whole consciousness. It is curious to note in those diagrams of experience which we have inherited from the more clear-sighted philosophers and seers, indications that they have enjoyed prolonged or transitory periods of this higher consciousness, described by Reisaja as the marriage of imaginative vision with moral transcendence. I think it at least a reasonable supposition that Plato's doctrine of ideas owed something to an intuition of this kind, 
for a philosophy, though it may claim to be the child of pure reason, is usually found to owe its distinctive character to the philosopher's psychological experience. The Platonic statements as to the veritable existence of the idea of a house, a table or a bed, and other such concrete and practical applications of the doctrine of the ideal, which have annoyed many metaphysicians, become explicable on such a psychological basis. That illuminated vision in which all things are made new can afford to embrace the homeliest as well as the sublimest things. And, as a matter of experience, it does do this, seeing all objects, as Monet saw the hayrick, as modes of light. Blake said that his cottage at Feltham was a shadow of the angels' houses, as I have already referred to the converted Methodist who saw his horses and hogs on the ideal plane. Again, when Plotinus, who was known to have experienced ecstatic states, speaks with the assurance of an explorer of an intelligible world and asks us, what other fire could be a better image of the fire which is there than the fire which is here? Or what other earth than this of the earth which is there? We seem to detect behind the language of Neoplatonic philosophy a hint of the same type of first-hand experience. The minds to whom we owe the Hebrew Kabbalah found room for it too in their diagram of the soul's ascent towards reality. The first Sephira above Malkuth, the world of matter, or lowest plane upon that tree of life which is formed by the ten emanations of the Godhead, is, they say, Yisod, the archetypal universe. In this are contained the realities, patterns, or ideas, whose shadows constitute the world of appearance in which we dwell. The path of the ascending soul upon the tree of life leads him first from Malkuth to Yisod, i.e., human consciousness in the course of its transcendence passes from the normal illusions of men to a deeper perception of its environment, a perception which is symbolized by the archetypal plane or world of platonic ideas. Everything in temporal nature, says William Law, is descended out of that which is eternal and stands as a palpable visible outbirth of it, so when we know how to separate the grossness, death and darkness of time from it, we find what it is in its eternal state. In eternal nature, or the kingdom of heaven, materiality stands in life and light. It is the light's glorious body, or that garment wherewith light is clothed, and therefore has all the properties of light in it, and only differs from light as it is its brightness and beauty, as the holder and displayer of all its colors, powers and virtues. When Law wrote this, he may have believed that he was interpreting to English readers the unique message of his master, Jacob Boehm. As a matter of fact, he was reiterating truths which a long line of practical mystics had been crying for centuries into the deaf ears of mankind. He was saying in the 18th century what Gregory of Nyssa had said in the 4th and Erigena in the ninth, telling the secret of that inviolate rose which can never be profaned because it can only be seen with the eyes of love. That serene and illuminated consciousness of the relation of things inward and outward, of the hidden treasure and its casket, the energizing absolute and its expression in time and space, which we have been studying in this chapter, is at its best a state of fine equilibrium, a sane adjustment of the inner and outer life. By that synthesis of love and will which is the secret of the heart, the mystic achieves a level of perception in which the whole world is seen and known in God, and God is seen and known in the whole world. It is a state of exalted emotion, being produced by love, of necessity it produces love in its turn. The sharp division between its in-looking and out-looking forms, which I have adopted for convenience of description, is seldom present to the minds which achieve it. They cleansed, fed and sanctified, are initiated into a spiritual universe where such clumsy distinctions have little meaning. All is alike part of the new life of peaceful charity, and that progressive abolition of selfhood, which is of the essence of mystical development, is alone enough to prevent them from drawing a line between the inward personal companionship and outward impersonal apprehension of the real. True illumination, like all real and vital experience, consists rather in the breathing of a certain atmosphere, the living at certain levels of consciousness, than in the acquirement of specific information. 
It is, as it were, a resting place upon the steep stairway of love, where the self turns and sees all about it a transfigured universe, radiant with that same light divine which nests in its own heart and leads it on. When man's desires are fixed immovably on his maker, as far as for deadliness and corruption of the flesh he is let, says Roll of the purified soul, which has attained the illuminated state, then it is no marvel that his strength manly using, first as it were heaven being opened, with his understanding he beholds high heavenly citizens, and afterwards sweetest heat, as it were burning fire he feels. Then with marvellous sweetness he is taught, and so forth in songful noise he is joyed. This, therefore, is perfect charity, which no man knows but he that hath it took, and he that it has taken it never leaves. Sweetly he lives, and sickly he shall die. Sweetly, it is true, the illuminated mystic may live, but not, as some think, placidly. Enlightenment is a symptom of growth, and growth is a living process which knows no rest. The spirit indeed is invaded by heavenly peace, but it is the peace not of idleness, but of ordered activity. A rest most busy, in Hilton's words, a progressive appropriation of the divine. The urgent push of an indwelling spirit, aspiring to its home in the heart of reality, is felt more and more as the invasion of the normal consciousness by the transcendental personality. The growth of the new man proceeds towards its term. Therefore the great seekers for reality are not as a rule long delayed by the exalted joys of illumination. Intensely aware now of the absolute whom they adore, they are aware too that though known, he is unachieved. Even whilst they enjoy the rapture of the divine presence, of life in a divine ideal world, something they feel makes default. So vogliote o dolce amore. Hence for them that which they now enjoy, and which passes the understanding of other men, is not a static condition. Often it coexists with that travail of the heart which Tola has called stormy love. The greater the mystic, the sooner he realizes that the heavenly manner which has been administered to him is not yet that with which the angels are full-fed. Nothing less will do, and for him the progress of illumination is a progressive consciousness that he is destined not for the sunny shores of the spiritual universe, but for the vast and stormy sea of the divine. Here, says Rusburick, of the soul which has been lit by the uncreated light, there begins an eternal hunger, which shall never more be satisfied. It is the inward craving and hankering of the effective power and created spirit after an uncreated good. And as the spirit longs for fruition, and is invited and urged thereto by God, she must always desire to attain it. Behold, here begin an eternal craving and continual yearning in eternal insatiableness. These men are poor indeed, for they are hungry and greedy, and their hunger is insatiable. Whatsoever they eat and drink, they shall never be satisfied, for this hunger is eternal. Here are great dishes of food and drink, of which none know but those who taste them. But full satisfaction and fruition is the one dish that lacks them, and this is why their hunger is ever renewed. Nevertheless, in this contact, rivers of honey, full of all delight, flow forth, for the spirit tastes these riches under every mode that it can conceive or apprehend. But all this is according to the manner of the creatures, and is below God. And hence there remains an eternal hunger and impatience. If God gave to such a man all the gifts which all the saints possess, and all that he is able to give, but without giving himself, the craving desire of the spirit would remain hungry and unsatisfied. End of Part 2, Chapter 4